Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the podcast. Today, we have Greg Mead on the show, uh, an entrepreneur that I respect very much who's building games in the outdoor space and just doing some really cool viral stuff. Greg, how are you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing great. So how did things get started for you with your first company that you're still working on today? Yeah, so we started CrossNet about four and a half, five years ago. Uh, went through a production run of of about a year long process, uh, just getting samples on samples of just you know innovating, creating the product and making it better. And finally, found a you know found a product that we were comfortable with. Um, when we launched that about four and a half years ago, and uh, since then it's just been a snowball effect. Uh, you know, you, you put the game up on the beach, the backyards, the fields, the parks, wherever people see it, people come up to it. You know, they record it, they ask about it, and uh, it, it's it's been crazy. Um, it's been a, it's been a long journey, but we're excited to finally see like our, our actual product come to life and we see it out in public all the time. Uh, so that, that's been my first, uh, this has been my first real, you know, entrepreneurship journey of, of like a real product that I really love. And uh, we eventually came out uh, more skis for CrossNet. We have the soccer version, pickleball coming out. So it's, it's exciting stuff. Nice. What did that ideation process look like when you were figuring out how to launch this game and what to launch? Like you could have done basketball. I know you're also an investor in U-Ball. You could have done like a million different products. Why? What What landed you on this? Uh, I think so. I was we, I was with my partner, Mike, at the time, and we were like brainstorming a bunch of ideas on the couch one night because we were trying to actually make a product. It didn't just like come right like most ideas just come to people like when you're talking or out in out and about right maybe in the shower and brainstorming um but this we were we were we set out on a mission to create a product together um, me chris and mike and we came up with a bunch of ideas and we we all grew up playing sports we didn't grow up playing volleyball we grew up playing soccer basketball i played tennis um chris played football mike did other played golf uh, and then we just literally came up with a backyard beach game. We wanted to be the next can jam, right? We grew up playing can jam, loving can jam. So we wanted to be that next black, yellow Mike shouted out four square volleyball. And then we're like, wow, that's it. <laughs> and, uh, we really knew it from there. We literally checked off everything else that was on our list and four square volleyball was, was it. And we, we got some prototypes from Walmart the next day, friends came over and we literally just made a prototype on my mom's backyard. That's pretty cool. Now, I feel like everyone has a million product ideas like they do business ideas. What is the differentiator in having the idea and then, you know, those who are able to actually execute on it? Yeah, I mean, you got to just follow through with it, right? Like if you have an idea and, and, you're, and you're confident in it, do whatever you need. Uh, for us, we had to utilize all our resources. We literally moved from Connecticut, a farm town, the three of us. We went straight to South Beach, Miami. Uh, and we set it up on the beach every day, every day, every day. We took out all of our money from, you know, our our savings from our jobs at the time or 401ks, whatever we had. And we we invested it all into the product and uh, we went all in. We were super confident about it. So yeah, if you have a good product and you're confident about it, go all in. Um, it's for people that are wanting to do that. It's definitely, you know, a challenge and scary, but you got to do it. And it, it should come to life if you keep working on it day in and day out. What allowed you to be so confident about a four square volleyball game? That's a good question. Um, I guess the real answer is we had so much fun playing it that we knew if other people stepped in those squares, they'd have that same enjoyment. And that's, that's what happened. But at the end of the day, like I was working on social media at other entrepreneur ventures. Chris was a good salesman. Mike was an engineer, our three founders. And we knew if we all just, you know, collided and put our brains together, we would make it work too. So if you have a good product and you have good people, it works. So you have that. Now, how do you get it out there? Apart from social, I mean, it, are most of the sales direct from social or what is, or is are you still fighting to get in stores? Like what does the landscape look like for games in 2023? Yeah. So we started on the D 2 C side, right? We were running like Twitter ads, Instagram memes, but we really started, and like I said snowball effect earlier, is when we moved on to South Beach and we went to the beach every day. We went to the same beach, we set it up, we talked to parents, kids were playing. Um, it's funny because we can actually track it. We used to be able to track it back then when we weren't getting too many online sales and the volume was small. We'd play with like a family from like Michigan, right? And then we played with a family in Michigan in Miami. And then a week later, we get an order from Michigan once they got home from from their vacation. Right, right, right. So like once we put that two and two together, we're like, 
we just need to keep setting these up and play and we get, you know, cash that way when we wouldn't have to, you know, spend any marketing dollars in the beginning like that. Cool. Um, and then, you know, you, you start to get it in other places too. I know I see I, I either on, on your Twitter and, and your brother's Twitter, um, you know, how you're reaching out and sending out all those cold emails and cold DMs to retailers. What sort of, uh, you know, role do retailers play for products these days, in your opinion? And how has it, you know, differentiated from, you know, what you perceived it as growing up? Yeah, so it's it's different. It's difficult for sure because the DDC landscape isn't as like glamorous as it is for other products for outdoor space. It's tough. We have a high cat cost, um, especially for a product like ours. A lot of people don't know what it is the first time, so you have to remind them, remind them. It's not like a shampoo or a, you know a food product. They know what it is. They know what they're about to get. So with the retail space, we we've gone very. We're very fortunate to you know be able to crush it in Dick Sporting Goods, Academy Sports, Shields walmart all these big box stores um and it's it's done great for us it's uh people recognize it from online right and they see it in the stores and then they you know it goes to and like they remember it from online so then they they purchase it in store they play it, they set it up and then that snowball effect happens so retail is big for us especially as we're you know we have to diversify from different channels Got it. So people find it. It's like the old apple saying people need to say see things you know 10 times before they buy it or whatever the number is yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, that that's pretty cool that they see it online, and then you know the store just becomes like a pickup location, um, basically. Yeah, uh, exactly. And also, people with games like like most other things, you know, you want it immediately. Like that's the beautiful thing about food, is if you're hungry, you can have literally anything. If you live in a, a city or basically anywhere within 20 minutes of said craving. Um, Whereas, you know, with products, obviously, you know, a little bit harder uh, to, you know, satisfy that same need. But we're, we're getting closer and closer to that. I mean, you know, Amazon, you know, if that drone uh, situation ever comes to fruition, maybe I can order, you know, a cross net and have it in 25 minutes. Um, Hopefully it's not too heavy for the drone. <laughs> yeah, you might need a couple of drones. You might need, yeah. you might have like four, four or five of them carrying it down the highway. Um, where What do you, you know, where do you want to see this? Um, what is, you know, sort of the end goal? I know you've also launched a separate company with a ton more products. Um, but what, what is the end goal at this point for you or where do you want to see it become? Yeah. For CrossNet, especially, I I think I want to see it be like a legacy product. So it's, you know, our kids, kids are playing it when they get home from school. I think a big goal for for me personally, and like our, our brand and what we're trying to trying to do in the sports space is, is be the next big sporting good space uh, company, but let's get the, the kids off the phones. Mm-hmm. Like that's just been a big debate, like with me and like my family and stuff and people I see nowadays, it's like the, the kids are on the iPads so when they get home from school at the dinner table. It's like when I grew up, I used to just go outside and play a sport. I get play two on two basketball, four and four football, hit the baseball. It, it's, it's not like that anymore. It's, and it's getting, it's really sad. So um, I think that's a big personal goal of mine that I want to do with the business. Um, but externally, I want the business to just evolve and just be around forever. Um, it would be cool to, you know, say I, I created a sport and uh, it's here hundred years from now. Totally. It's so crazy about the kids, man. Like what the hell happened? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, it's an epidemic to be honest. It's really sad and unfortunate, <laughs> but I think, you know, doing, creating these backyard games. And I see other competitors and, and friends out there that are doing it. And it's only going to help at the end of the day. Like people always ask me like, oh, do you guys hate spike ball and stuff? It's like, no, if you actually play a spike ball, you're going to probably play cross net vice versa. Um, and all these other new backyard games coming out like U ball and stuff. So if, if you like cross net, hopefully you like U ball and we're not on the phones and we're enjoying life and getting healthy. <laughs> yeah. That's the underrated aspect of it too. I feel like the reason uh, I think the obvious reason for, you know, why uh, kids are spending so much more time on devices is because it used to be the dopamine you got from physical exercise, you know, baseball, basketball, football, et cetera, outweighed the quality and dopamine hits that the video games of the era gave you. And now with social, with the quality of games now, and, you know, the intricacy and studying of young human behavior to maximize, you know, 
time spent on it, it outweighs the dopamine hits that you get from physical sports. And that is insane. And everybody has, I feel like the only thing that can turn it around is if people realize that because obviously one is good for you and one isn't, but if you're in it, sometimes it's hard to realize. Yeah, absolutely. I realized that as of late too, because I'm addicted to my phone. Like most people, I've been leaving my phone outside the bedroom. I've been not picking it up as soon as I, you know, wake up, I give it a half an hour, hour. And it's honestly been just a big help in my, you know, my daily work mode and in just life. Um, a lot of people are addicted to that and it, it needs to change. Otherwise we're doomed. And uh, the, our kids and the kids below them, uh, we're going to be setting ourselves up for a, uh, a weird economy. And uh, I don't know if people are going to want to like really work like that anymore. So it's, it's crazy, but yeah, going back to like the dopamine thing, I, I don't, I don't think necessarily video games are, are bad. Like I encourage, I used to be a crazy big gamer and I think that's helped me along my like entrepreneur journey to like, shift that into like a, a business model mm-hmm. so i think that's super important for kids to still play video games and, and make their brains work that way and challenge them but like it's the social media endless scrolling that needs to stop yeah i remember i played minecraft growing up that that contributed to actually it was like a lot of us like right when the game first launched it was free at the time that's how long ago it was and uh you know pre-microsoft and you know, a bunch of people would jump on the server. It would be like a really good time. You'd all play on Minecraft and then you would, um, then you would go out and play basketball together. Um, yeah. but I don't know if it's like that anymore, man. I don't know if it, I, <laughs> so, so time spent is crazy, but yeah, the social media scrolling is, um, whoo, TikTok, man. Yeah. I wouldn't mind if they shut that down, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. It's, it would hurt uh, businesses, but it's a it's a win for me. Yeah, it'd probably be a win for society. Yeah, for sure. Probably be a win for society. Yeah, it's crazy how you know in in China they're seeding you know science and uh, you know helpful educational content, and then here in the U.S. it's just like girls twerking. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so talk to me about this new company that you've launched with Danny Duncan. I'll, I'll, I'm curious to hear more. I remember you sent me a little bit on it before, but um, I'd love to yeah. hear you know how all that's going. I saw that viral video of you know the uh, what what was that that shot up in the air? That's our Bubble Bash product. So yeah, so Good Sport is a uh, is a different company from CrossNet. We launched that with the sole purpose of. Um, so throughout the years of CrossNet, we've had hundreds of ideas of new sporting goods products that just couldn't fall under that four square line, which is, which is CrossNet. So all these products we were, we've been developing and we putting it under a new company called Good Sport. A lot of members from our CrossNet team are on Good Sport. And then we decided to collaborate with uh, YouTube influencer, Danny Duncan, um, good buddy of us now, of ours now. And, uh, he loves sports. He's really good at sports and he knows how to make great content. So in, in the, you know, in the state of, you know, we are today with the economy, the DDC, iOS updates, it's hard to, you know, have good marketing efficiency and, and spend, keep your spend low. So with Danny, he helps us, you know, keep our spend low and he does a lot of the marketing for us. So we're excited for like retail this year. We're going in a few big box stores. Um, can't name drop just yet, but uh, we'll be able to do like in-store retail activations with him too, he'll meet and greets and he'll be able to have all these like fans come to the store and it'll be crazy. Great videos for him. Great videos, for, you know, for, for good sport. That's awesome. Through this, have what have you learned about working with YouTubers specifically? Have you found that their audience is so much more active than that of every other social platform? That's basically what I've seen, but I haven't worked with any directly. Yeah, absolutely. YouTube is key. It's like the, there's so, only a certain amount of like really good YouTube influencers um, that have like this cult following essentially, but the 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 quality of followers and like branding is way better on youtube than instagram or tiktok that's just quick scrolling these are like real viewers and and, and followers that genuinely enjoy and love that that person so yeah youtube's great for for any brand if you can land an influencer deal that they have a good youtube channel um, that's the way kind of the d2c space is growing influencer youtube influencers um they want equity in brands and uh, i don't blame them they should they deserve it yeah we, we should definitely talk about that so logan paul with prime Emma Chamberlain with Chamberlain Coffee, you know, KSI with Prime as well. Mr. Beast, who's the greatest creator to ever live, um, you know, with his 
dozens of products. Do you see a world where all of the, you know, Fortune 500 companies are acquiring all of these creator brands? Or do you think these creators could potentially see these through and outpace and eventually turn the revenue ship around and be in true competition with these conglomerates? Yeah, I think there's two two parts that I think a lot of them will just be sold to these big ass companies, right? Like it's it's hard not to say yes to a big paycheck, right? From like a, a Hershey's or whatever. But um, I, I think there's definitely a space where the influencer um, and their brand can just take it to the next level and be that next big company. Um, that's the way it's going. That's the direction it's going. Like for us, we want to come up with it dozens and hundreds and thousands of sporting goods games. If we're making great cash flow and it's profitable, it would be hard for us to sell, right? To another competitor of ours. And to be honest, those competitors we're trying to beat and be the next, you know, big company. So uh, there's two different angles there. Uh, and, but I see it definitely the influence just taking over the space and just growing out different product lines. But they got to be cautious and smart about it because you're obviously going to saturate your brand eventually um, and your followers and you don't want to go too crazy and you want to make sure everything's flowing. You're not rushing and coming out with dozens of things every year. Yeah, the trickiest thing, uh, you know, that I've seen from working with creators, being sort of a creator, uh, you know, for a bunch of years now, is mo it's like you know an extreme version of the NFL where most only last a couple of years, um, and then the burnout is real. So, but that says even more about the people that have lasted because they have to love it, like they have to love doing it, and they can't stop. I heard a really funny analogy the other day. Uh, that, you know, creators are, uh, you know, like strippers in the sense that when they stop making content, the music stops and they can't do anything. Like there's no brand behind them that they can continue to sell against for decades. Um, you know, so that would, that's my only, like, that's the thing that I'm most curious about with these brands is how do they, how do the creators make it bigger than themselves? And I think Logan Paul and KSI are a great example of that. Like they have so much, they've built such a strong brand that it feels to me like there's a chance that in a few years it could last just on the backs of what they've done and nothing, and they don't have to do anything. How, how do you look at that? Yeah, absolutely. That's the same model we're going to take. Uh, there's a lot of influencers and creator brands like that, that, I mean, aren't like that. And that will fall off. Um, I can name a few, but I'm not going to. But if if you don't, if you're not able to create a good product, it's not going to last. The product needs to be good at the end of the day. If you have a mediocre, you know, food product, it's going to fall off if the influencer, you know, stops selling it, promoting it, and doesn't build that brand behind it. Prime, those guys have done a great job. Um, they made a good product, and that that will last with or without Logan and KSI behind it for sure. And that's the same model we're taking. We want it to just be a legacy brand and. People go to our, our products, they see our products in 12 years from now, and they they know good sport, and that's the brand. A cool thing about Danny Duncan, though, is he's actually lasted. Oh, like yeah. and, and like you said before, quality of followers, that's an underrated thing as well, especially with shorts now. Everybody has you know millions of subscribers now on YouTube because shorts just allows you to explode an audience. But those people didn't you know, connect with yeah. you in long form content over a long period of time. And I think yeah. that is incredibly underrated now. Yeah. Those short, short uh, followers are similar to like the Instagram TikTok followers rather than the long form followers. But yeah, Danny's been doing this for a decade plus and he's not slowing down anytime soon. He's continuing to grow um, and he makes good content. You have to make good content and sell a good product and you'll be able to last for sure. But like a lot of the creators, they, they want to, you know, get in, involved in equity and, and equity based businesses and, and have, you know, portfolios behind them rather than just the YouTube, because who knows all this stuff can be, you know, gone, gone tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, you see big creators, you know, channels shut down, yeah. uh, like some of the, the, you know, great guys from Nelk. I mean, yeah. it's crazy how that happens. What, what have you learned about making content from, from Danny? Um, I think, I think the, the biggest lesson so far, we, we just started, so we're, we're fairly new in this, but is to be very like cautious about what you put out, have great quality content, not just keep posting bullshit. Right. Um, and, and I think that goes a long way and it's done, done numbers for us right now, high quality retail sees that they pick up on it. Uh, that, that's, 
that's a great uh, model to follow, I think, for brands. If you want to be like an elite brand, right? So, and then all our UGC, like little content, we'll be posting that still, just different channels, different avenues, maybe for like meta ads, um, backend stuff, things like that. What about on on the cross net front? What have you learned about you know what actually works in uh, converting people from you know random person to cross net fan to cross net buyer? Yeah, so I th- it took us a while, but eventually we have to we focused and we realized who our actual buyer was when we first started cross net. We knew everyone would enjoy it, but we we thought like oh like the twenty two year old college kid with his shirt off is gonna really love this. And that's going to be our, our main buyer. Uh, it took us like about a year and a half, two years to really figure out who's purchasing. And uh, that's been key for us. Like our biggest purchaser is a, like a 60, 62 year old mom, right. And they're buying it for their kid, their son who saw it on TikTok, but doesn't have the money to purchase it. And the mom eventually buys it when they go to the store or online for the eighth time when the kid's shouting at her to do something outside or the mom wants to get the kid off the damn phone and let's get something in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's that's been our that's our focus. And the content shifted from those volleyball athletes to the to the jock kids, right? To like 13-year-old kids playing with their dad and like a dog and the sister, right? And then we target the mom on the on the advertising channels. And uh, that's done great for us. And we're gonna continue to do that and grow that kind of content. Cool. And then how much do you think about just content in general, like being an entertainment slash media company in addition to the product? Or is that something you're not interested in at all? No, no, it's it's, it's kind of a model we take. It, it's like we have a bunch of UGC content just pouring in, pouring in. We're trying to shift the content as like I was saying, like high quality content for our main pages and then our, our sub pages, which we have like cross net soccer, cross net pickleball. Sure. Uh, those would just be like, those would just be content, Quantity. content. Yeah. Quantity. Yeah. And then our main page will be quality. Yeah. Cool. If if you could go back, you know, to the beginning of it, what things would you tell yourself now? Oh, if I can go back to the beginning. Wow. You'd probably tell yourself what the true audience is. I'm yes, sure. for sure. I think internally is like stay small, stay lean. We had a great few years. Um, like the COVID year really spiked us. And then after that, we got super comfortable. We started making some stupid, not stupid hires, but just like hires that weren't needed where like me, Chris, and like our core team now, we have like uh, eight employees, seven employees. We work really well together with small knit team branching out to like, we branched out to like 25 contractors, employees. And it was just too much. It kind of took us away from like that small nitty gritty. Like we're still a small business at the end of the day. So we have, I like to roll my sleeves up, get work done. I, I work better than five employees, right? Like, cause it's my brand. I know what I want. Um, it's, it's turned me into like a manager and worrying about people's time and vacation times and, and all that nonsense. So I think that's probably our biggest mistake is, is going head first and not getting too comfortable. When you, when a business starts making that cash flow, stay, you know, stay lean and, and, and make the good decisions. That's a pretty valuable lesson. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's definitely easier said than done, but I yeah, can see sure. how how having to manage those people and all the details relevant from the business can take, you know, too much time away to focus on the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Um, you know, for new products and new companies, and even I'll ask this, you know, when uh, you know, the opportunity came up with Danny, how did you? How do you look at evaluating a creator? And whether they're capable of being partnered with a business or, you know, how would you advise somebody to do it the next time? Um, I would look at like their dedication to it. Like, did, did this creator reach out to you? Did I reach out to that creator to try to pitch them um, and have a genuine, regardless of like the percentage of whatever they get, um, just make sure you have a genuine relationship. Like with us and Danny, Danny's like, Hey, let's just do the company together. Like I love sports. I can make the products with you. Like Danny's hands on with me. Like, customizing products like that's really awesome if the creator's not doing that or you know he's not he or she's not going to do that don't get it i wouldn't i wouldn't go down that rabbit hole Mm -hmm. um but as far as like the splits and percentages that that's all based on on what your evaluation of the business is what you can bring to the table versus the creator right like for us we're super comfortable with selling sporting goods right so we know we we can do this with our internal team um bringing on the creator is just like an extra you know fuel on the fire which is like amazing um, but some brands don't have that, right? They're going into it head first, brand new. So maybe that creator gets a majority of the business, right? Um, so 
different different angles for different products and teams that you you collab together. Sure. What what would you tell somebody who's just starting out a product? You know, what what would you advise for them? Let's say in the general sports space, but not specifically like a game product. Make step one, make sure the product is good. Um, if there's any defects, any quality issues, just make sure that product is is up to par. So you're not starting off your business just like with bad quality. That doesn't usually happen in other spaces with like small CPG products. So with the backyard, like the game space, like that, that product has to be good quality. And there's like some really bad quality products out there. Like our knockoffs, the people who knock cross off, like that quality is actually bad. Like it'll snap and stuff. So just make sure you have a good, good, good product and that'll, that'll lead, lead the way. How do patents work on, on things like this? Do they? <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it, patents are, are very tricky. If, if you have a, a, a very unique product, um, I, I've talked about this here and there in the the past, but it, be cautious about you know getting IP. Get your trademarks, get your websites, get your international trademarks. Um, as far as patents, I would, I would really focus on getting a patent if you have like a, a tech product, a tech-based product that can you know, is worth a lot. If you have like, if you're trying to like set up a volleyball net or like make a new basketball hoop or something, like it's very hard to get a patent for that unless it's very different and you can have like a utility and a design on it. Um, so it's tricky. Um, I tell people just be very cautious about, you know, spending 15 grand on a patent. Um, make sure you're comfortable with it. If you're confident in that patent and that design, then get it. If you're not confident, you have ever, you know, any hesitancy, um, that's probably going to be the same route those those competitors are to come in and just just make a patent. And then what are you going to fight them for 150 grand and it takes you two years and maybe you might win. So I would yeah. try to stay out of that legal, legal thing and just work on selling the products. That makes sense. And maybe you just saved a couple of people a lot of money. So yeah, sure. <laughs> everyone asked me that and it's like, just be, if you're confident in it, get it. If not, don't worry and just keep going. Cool. Well, that is excellent advice for people. Yeah. I think in all walks, I'm sure. Uh, well, Greg, thank you so much for doing this, man. This was great. Super valuable. I'm, I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else did. Where where the hell can people find you best? You can find me on all socials at woe is mead, like woe is me, but my last name, M-E-A-D-E. And then you can find Crossnet, Crossnet Game, Crossnet on socials, and then uh, play good sport for good sport products. Hell yeah. Good stuff, man. Keep crushing it. Thanks, brother. Talk soon. All right, everybody. See you next time. Peace.